Welcome everybody to today's Consortium of University for Global Health webinars, part of our webinar series. We have a very exciting topic today on the WHO reforms COVID-19 and the US departure from the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is the leading public health international agency designed to protect all of our health, everybody's health, though particularly to be able to protect those who are most vulnerable in our world. However, this year, the organization has been rocked, rocked by the single biggest public health challenge in the last 100 years, and also with the departure of the United States and defunding by the United States of the organization. We have today four outstanding presenters that will shed light on these problems. I want to remind everybody, for those who have actually um, registered, this is a CME accredited webinar. The first speaker that we have is Dr. Michelle Berry. Dr. Berry is the Director for the Center of Innovation and Global Health at Stanford University. She's also the Chair of CUGH. She'll be followed by Professor Larry Gostin. Professor Gostin is the Director of the WHO's Collaborating Center on National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University. And after Dr. Gostin will be Dr. Stephen Morrison. Dr. Morrison is the Senior Vice President and the Director of Global Health Policy at the Global Health Policy Center at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And finally, Dr. Jonathan Quick is the Managing Director of Pandemic Response and Preparedness and Prevention at the Rockefeller Foundation and the author of the book, The End of Epidemics. I'd be very pleased to turn it over to Dr. Berry. Dr. Berry, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Over to you. Good morning, everybody, or good evening from wherever you're zooming into. Um, my section of this seminar or webinar is to give you some background about the WHO. Um, some fast facts is the WHO was founded in 1948 um, after um, World War II. Its headquarters are in Geneva, Switzerland, and it has a number member states of 194. Its budget um, is about almost five billion dollars um, over two years um, which is about the budget of a big teaching hospital in the united states so it's not a very large um, budget um, it does have regional um, it has six regional areas or offices in africa um, the mediterranean europe the americas southeast asia and the western pacific um, its overarching mission is um, attainment of health, um, but it really is uh, the way it supports its mission is not by being a regulator or an enforcer. It provides technical assistance to countries, it sets international health standards and provides guidance on health issues, and it coordinates the international responses um, to health emergency. And it, it's a big advocate, but I want to um, emphasize that it is not an enforcer or regulator. Its next, uh, um, it, it, its next four-year plan uh, is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for one billion, and they're really focusing now on universal health coverage, protecting people against health emergencies, and then obviously the usual enjoying health and better well-being. So this sounds like uh, large um, missions, but in, in actuality, um, they do do deep, deep dives into responses. And here, um, because there's been a lot of criticism about what the WHO uh, has done for COVID-19, I thought this was an interesting slide to just show you that um, they have shipped PPE, personal protective equipment, to over 135 countries, 4 million gowns, millions of goggles, gloves, medical mass. They are a coordinator of the solidarity trials um, in which there are multi-countries involved with 3,500 patients involved, more than 400 hospitals in 35 countries with 10 candidate vaccines in clinical evaluation um, and many more in preclinical evaluation. And this includes drugs as well. They have a, a partners platform because 
as I think you'll hear from us and some of the, well, from myself for sure, and many and the other speakers, is that we need a pattern of global governance. They have 143 countries onboarded um, into the COVID-19 response with national plans uploaded and shared um, and uh, donor contributions. They've strengthened laboratory, oops, sorry. They've strengthened laboratory, um, sorry. They've strengthened laboratory capacity um, by sending um, many swab kits out to 135 countries. And I know um, there was a lot of brouhaha about the fact that the U.S. did not accept um, the WHO kits at the beginning when uh, CDC did send out kits that were uh, malfunctioning. They work for R&D for tools to be accessible to all um, with development of technology access. Um, they will be addressing fair and equitable distribution of vaccines. And they also, even though this is not their main function, um, their main function is around technical guidance. They do have a small emergency team um, called GORN, Global Outreach and Response Network, um, which does send missions to uh, various countries. They have achieved some wonderful achievements. The Alma Ata Declaration on Primary Care in 1978, the framework, um, really the, the only uh, global governance on tobacco control, which was adapted in 2003, um, the eradication of smallpox, um, and the revision of the international health regulations. And I want to spend a few seconds on what the IHR is. This is, uh, represents an agreement between 196 countries, including all of the WHO members, to work together for global health security. And you're going to hear a little bit more from Dr. Quirk about more, just about the global health security agenda. But I wanted to talk about the IHR, which really makes sure that surveillance systems and laboratories can de detect potential threats. Threats. They work together with other countries and they make the decision about public health emergencies of international import. They report specific diseases. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the small delay in calling a public health um, emergency of inter international concern for COVID-19. Um, but they did it pretty quickly and they respond to public health events. Um, GORN, which is that small um, group, and I really, I have to say, eight operational staff in Geneva for the entire world uh, for global outbreak is really what I would call a very small and underfunded um, group in the WHO. But this is, GORN does have 250 technical institutions and networks working with them, and they foster regional and global networks um, to, to actually help with public health emergencies. And they do train people for field response and standards for collaborative public health. Um, and they engage staff um, and resources from partner institutions. Uh, to help with these public health emergencies. The revenue of the WHO is two primary sources, and I do want to spend a few seconds about this. There's the assessed contributions. That is the amount that members are, um, you could say it's tax, but they're really assessed to pay. And each member is scaled by income and population, and that's the assessed contribution that they're supposed to give. And then there are voluntary contributions, and these are other funds provided by member states or private organizations like the Gates Foundations and individuals. Um, and these voluntary contributions are earmarked um, for what these private organizations and individuals want them to going, going towards. Whereas assessed contributions um, is really what I would call the operating budget, my operating budget uh, for WHO. And you can see that's very small. It's only 17% of the entire budget. Uh, is assessed and the majority of the WHO money is earmarked for where these voluntary contributions go. So in ending, I wanted to talk about some of the challenges that the WHO has. It's got a growing scope of responsibility and really a budget that has remained flat for years or been reduced and is going to be dramatically reduced um, when the US pulls out. A budget that has become less flexible in its um, ability to be placed in areas that the WHO needs for its operating budget. It has greater reliance on voluntary contributions, as I said, earmarked, 
It's cumber. No one says it's perfect. It is cumbersome. It is decentralized. It does have bureaucrat bureaucratic governance, um, but it is the one form of shared glo global governance that we have around health. There's a dual mandate of being both a technical agency with health expertise and a, and a political body where states debate and negotiate about where their health money is going. Just to give you an idea of how flat the U.S. contributions uh, to the World Health um, um, Organization has been, the uh, dark blue um, is the, the one that's the assessed contributions, and then the voluntaries are, and I think one of our other speakers will be talking to you about where those go from the U.S. Um, as everybody on this call knows, President Trump announced in April that the U.S. would suspend all funding and announced in May the eventual departure of the U.S. from WHO. Um, and not to steal anyone's thunder, I think it's happening immediately, and I'll let Dr. Gostin tell you a little bit about that. And I'll end on this slide that I feel very strongly about and have written about, and that's this concept of interdependent sovereignty. And that relates to the ability of countries to control what I would call existential threats that absolutely transcend borders, such as air pollution, climate change, and pandemic infectious diseases. Um, and I would call for an action that we need shared global governance for that. Over to you, Larry. Thanks, Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, I learn from you every single time I hear from you, and it's uh, it's lovely to see you and hear you. I think you thought your account of the World Health Organization was really um, terrific. Um, I've I've had a it's a rough day today. I've just got off um, testifying for the Canadian Parliament on the World Health Organization, and um, it hasn't been announced publicly, and you know so we can't confirm this. But yes. Um, uh, Currently, the, um, the president did announce a while back that he was intending to withdraw from WHO, um, but there has been thus far no official announcement of the withdrawal. Um, it could happen um, imminently. Um, uh, my colleagues and I have um, now assembled about a thousand uh, signatures from the leading um, uh, organizations and individuals in the United States on public health. Our our view is is that um, this would be one of the most ruinous presidential decisions um, in our modern lifetime, um, and it would be detrimental to the United States um, security interests, as well as a violation of both um, U.S. law and international law. Um, to be very clear, um, the United States joined the World Health Organization under a joint congressional resolution um, that requires the United States to give one year's notice of its, of its withdrawal um, and to pay all current assessments. Um, and so even if we do see an official withdrawal letter, it would not take effect for, for um, a year, and where and 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 our group believes that uh, Congress absolutely has the power to block the president, and and it should. So the question is why? Um, I think uh, why should it block it? Michelle, uh, what I, what I, what I loved about her talk um, was not just what WHO is doing with COVID-19, but what it does every day. Um, with its efforts for polio eradication, injury prevention, mental health, um, uh, 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 universal health coverage, a whole range of, of issues that um, are really indispensable uh, for that. Uh, WHO has been caught in the middle of a geopolitical power struggle, um, principally between the two of great superpowers, China and the United States. Um, both are deflecting blame. Um, both have engineered conspiracy theories about the origin of the virus in, in Wuhan, as well as uh, many other um, uh, uh, false accusations. 
And unfortunately, the World Health Organization has been caught in the middle um, just at the moment when the world needs to unite around a common purpose and global solidarity. Um, there's blaming, there's um, political um, uh, disputes. Uh, there have been price competitions for personal protective equipment, uh, ventilators, test kits. And of course, um, the most important, most consequential decision in, in many of our lifetimes is the race for the vaccine. Will, will we cut corners and have an unsafe vaccine? Will we skip ethics? But most of all, will we ensure the equitable distribution of vaccines um, when they are there as a global public good and not based upon price, the ability to pay or intellectual property. Um, now is the time to plan for equity in, in vaccine distribution before we know who wins that race. And WHO is the clear um, uh, 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 entity um, that can help us there just when they're being weakened. You know, as I, as I mentioned to the uh, Canadian Parliament, you know, I've and I've worked with the World Health Organization now for over 30 years. I know them really well. Um, I'm their dearest friend, but but good friends will tell them honestly um, when they've gone wrong, and they have. They're not a perfect organization. Sometimes they can be maddeningly, maddeningly bureaucratic and 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 difficult. They do drop the ball sometimes, um, but overall. Um, I believe that they've done well with this pandemic and generally speaking, and Dr. Tedros um, has done an admirable job. There have been several um, political critiques made, and I, I say political because I believe that they're, that they're highly um, partisan and, and politically oriented, particularly in my own country, but also other countries. Um, we see it, um, you know, the politicking around uh, uh, COVID and, you know, in, in other, uh, with other strong populist leaders that thump their chest, whether it's, you know, Putin or Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro and even uh, to a certain extent, Xi Jinping. Um, so uh, the first critique was, is that WHO um, did not alert the world early enough. And this was even before it declared a public health emergency of international concern, as Michelle said and that they didn't um, inform the world um, that there was a community transmission going on in Wuhan and Hubei province uh, in China very early on in the pandemic. Both of those things uh, were, were untrue. That is, you know, we, there was circulating virus well before the first Chinese report. And um, there was, it was well known that there was um, a widespread human to human transmission, even when China was reporting otherwise. I know that uh, Dr. Tedros was pushing China behind the scenes diplomatically, but he took the decision not to criticize China publicly. I respect that. If it were me, I probably would have said, these are the data we're getting from China, but I can't independently verify it. But to blame the WHO, for pandemics, for epidemics or outbreaks that are happening in the United States or any other country, um, is simply outrageous, in my view. And I, and and frankly, I'm beginning to be fed up with the misinformation. Yes, I would have um, suggested that a more transparent approach at the beginning, um, but WHO, make mo no mistake, has no power to force itself on a country or to independently verify its, its data. I think it should have that power, but currently we have the World Health Organization we deserve. Why? First, we fund it pitifully. Secondly, um, most of its money is controlled by donors, not by the organization itself. Thirdly, um, when anything goes wrong, we blame it. We don't give it political backing when we should do that. And fourthly, while the international health regulations are 
by and large, a good set of regulations, there have been widespread government non-compliance with those regulations. Um, to blame WHO for all those faults, um, I think is entirely um, unfair and unjustified. Uh, we need a World Health Organization that's strong. And now um, we're in an unprecedented crisis. Um, we've, none of us have experienced anything like this in our lifetimes. We're all huddled up in our homes, sheltering in place. Um, there's a, a, an assault on science and, and public health expertise. Um, there's an assault on institutions like the CDC in the US, like the World Health Organization. And we have a choice as a world. Um, we can either choose um, to uh, make this crisis into one that shatters us all, fragments us all, where we're pointing the finger of blame, um, and, uh, or, uh, and, and, to, and to close down the rule of law, close down international travel, trade, globalism, all, all of the things that have alleviated or helped to alleviate absolute poverty. Or our other choice is to unite, um, to take a path that strengthens our, our institutions like the WHO, that strengthens international law like the international health regulations, that funds our institutions um, sustainably and strongly, um, and that respects um, human rights and the rule of law. Uh, I hope that out of this crisis will come an opportunity. Remember, um, we're approaching the 75th anniversary of the World Health Organization and the United Nations. That came out of an unspeakable tragedy of World War II, um, but we were able to get the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the United Nations, uh, the launching of the World Health Organization as the first specialized agency of the United Nations. Um, we can do that again with this crisis, or um, we can um, revert to our own worlds and our own nationalism and our own populism and undermine the, the rule of law and the importance of science. I truly hope we're gonna take the road toward mutual solidarity, health, and most of all, health equity within countries and among them. And I'm very grateful to CUGH for organizing this panel. It's extraordinarily important. Thank you. And over to you, Steve, um, a, a terrific thinker on these problems. Good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS. Um, a few remarks follow on Michelle and Larry's um, excellent uh, comments. The, um, there is a problem that we don't have an answer to at the moment, which is in the latter part of last year, there was an outbreak of this new novel coronavirus in Wuhan, uh, in Hubei province, and it was covered up for somewhere between six to eight weeks before it was disclosed in December 31st. And the question is, in that period when there was open field for spread of this virus, while it was being covered up for political and administrative and bureaucratic reasons within, largely within Hubei province party authorities, who could have known what was going on in that period? Who could have known from outside? I mean, we know that the US government dismantled its CDC presence in Beijing. I'm not sure that CDC officers would have necessarily known what was going on. But certainly WHO, which has no independent intelligence capacity and has no inspection authority, has no ability to bully states into compliance with their international health regulations and no prospect of ever getting inspection authority, frankly. Uh, it's a weak institution constitutionally and in terms of its mandate and its governance, and it has been since 1948. And this is a, another instance where people look at this problem. We have had this novel coronavirus. It appears and runs, runs free for a period of time while there's a political cover-up 
who's accountable for that, who should have known that was happening. After it was disclosed on the 31st, there's allegations uh, that the Chinese also withheld, delayed on the on the uh, uh, sharing of the of the ge genome sequencing data. That was January 10th. That was not a very long delay. Delayed admitting human to human transmission. Delayed sharing of specimens and and epi data. Delayed allowing. Uh, an inter, a WHO international uh, 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 expert group in until February 16th. These were all delays that had huge consequences and raised the question of the accountability of the Chinese. And the rest of the world now where we have over 9 million cases and almost half a million dead is now looking at these questions and asking, okay, what is the level of accountability for the Chinese? And what's the level of accountability in the future for some other government that has a novel virus appear on its door and decide to cover it up or delay and obfuscate at critical moments and then it gets out of the box and, and spreads. Um, WHO has been criticized uh, with some justification for being excessively deferential. Uh, some have described it as gushingly deferential to the Chinese in the period of January and February. I witnessed some of this. I hosted the Chinese WHO and others at the Munich Security Conference on February 15th to discuss the outbreak in China at that time. And it was very clear that the senior WHO personnel were under enormous pressure to, uh, to provide fulsome praise of, of the Chinese position echoing the Chinese narrative. And the Chinese narrative was that everything was going great, that this draconian crackdown that came to encompass uh, uh, 150 million people at one point uh, was, at will, was welcome, that there was no crackdown on journalists or doctors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this, was, this is the typical predicament that WHO finds itself in, whether it's dealing with the United States China or other sovereign member states. Taiwan was an issue, I'll say a bit more about that. So why did President Trump choose April 14th to announce that he's suspending funding and he's gonna do a review? And then you fast forward to May 29th and he announces that's it, we're ending funding and we're gonna end terminate membership. Why did he take those steps? Um, it's never been uh, uh, fully explained by the president himself, but the general sense is that this was driven by a couple of considerations. The first is electoral calculations. Um, we have an election in early November. Uh, we have a pandemic that has now killed 120,000 Americans and 2.3 million Americans have been sick, made sick, and we have unemployment over 20 million. So this is a, a, a utter catastrophe. We now have racial strife added into that. And, and police brutality and protests in 60 city, in, in over uh, 200 cities. Uh, Bolton, former National Security Advisor John Bolton, came out with his big book um, uh, just this week. And what's the central theme? The central theme is all foreign policy calculations come down to electrical, electoral considerations. And I think that's true here. And I think that it is, a, obviously, it's a deflection. It's a deflection. It's externalizing the blame for the failure, the catastrophic failure in the United States onto, onto China and then lumping WHO together with China, conflating them all and saying, well, WHO was a hapless uh, accomplice that was coerced into a cover-up, a, a systematic cover-up. And so it is no longer deserving of the kind of support that we have given and we're going to um, cut this relationship off. So as a matter of appealing to a domestic political base, you're striking a blow at multilateralism, which, which sells well uh, in America, particularly among the base. And you're also saying what really matters is not the pandemic. What really matters is our geostrategic confrontation with the Chinese. And our relationship with the Chinese is unraveling into mutual recrimination and conspiracy theory theories. Um, 
and we want to decouple from China. Uh, and the China hawks within the White House and outside of the White House were pushing this, this, this narrative. Let's pull off the gloves and go after the Chinese, escalate the, the confrontation, and, and, and health and pandemic response will be part of that now. It's not just security and IP and trade terms, it's also health. Um, there was an internal debate within the administration around the wisdom of doing this, uh, but those like, at different points, Secretary Pompeo, Robert Redfield at CDC, I assume that uh, uh, Secretary Azar were, were all arguing in favor of, we, let's not abandon this organization at this particular time in the second inning of a very long uh, pandemic. Uh, there was a draft letter that looked like it had been uh, written by the moderates, which was going to the president's desk, um, which was leaked fri the Friday evening right before the World Health Assembly pulled together. And, the, and that provoked a counter reaction from the likes of Peter Navarro, the China, the true China hawk within the administration who'd been made responsible for controlling uh, access to, to critical commodities in the pandemic response. It drew the support of Laura Ingraham and Tucker Carlson in the Fox News Network. It drew support from some of the uh, very conservative elements within the House of Representatives, Jim Jordan and others, and they reversed the course. And the next thing you knew was Azar coming to the World Health Assembly, making this announcement, and then the president following up uh, afterwards, and then the, the, the subsequent announcement. So the, the battle uh, over a more moderate versus a more radicalized uh, response was, was won by, by, by the hardliners. Uh, interestingly, um, you would have expected a more, you would have expected perhaps some uh, response among moderate Republicans, particularly in the Senate. Uh, there's some murmurs, but overall most Republicans either went silent or they fell in line formally uh, with the position that the administration um, was taking. So there wasn't a, uh, there, there, there wasn't a, an opening on a bipartisan basis. This looked more like the impeachment battles. Once it reached a certain point, folks pretty much fell in line. There was some grumbling around the margins, but nobody was picking this up and running with it among the Republicans. And the Democrats made noises, had, had hearings, made press statements and the like, but haven't exactly picked this up and moved with it as a very significant issue. Vice President Biden, I should, I should add, has been very strong and very clear on, on opposing this and, 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 and making clear that this position would be reversed should he win the election. What we're waiting for now, Larry Gostin referenced, um, that we're waiting for a formal letter to be transmitted from the administration, probably through Ambassador Kraft at USUN to the Secretary General Guterres uh, at the UN announcing the termination of our uh, membership, our withdrawal from membership. We don't know what's in that. We know that last week there was a uh, meeting at the White House, an interagency meeting in which it was announced that there was going to be an, a rule of no engagement across agencies with WHO unless you could come forward and, and, and make a credible case that that specific program was tied to U.S. national interests and public safety. And so there is a there is a there's some provision there where perhaps some program, maybe it's polio, or maybe it's some other program that matters significantly, get some kind of carve out, but we don't know, we shall see. There are a number of things that we need to think about. We have today 28 American, senior American scientists uh, seconded to WHO, and two and three in the pipeline. What happens to these people? Some of them are very senior. Maria Kerkhoff, the lead on COVID-19, uh, at WHO is an American seconded to WHO. What happens to these people? Do they Are they allowed to serve out their term? Presumably, if that's allowed, those in the pipeline stop and there's no renewal of these commitments and that program, that sort of interlinkage and scientific and public health collaborations is broken. Uh, 
but maybe there's going to be some ex exceptions. What happens to the collaborating centers? There are over 30 collaborating centers uh, in the United States, including one that Larry runs. Um, what happens to these? And do they have any recourse? Can Larry Gostin go to court against the Trump administration as the leader of a collaborating center? I don't know, we'll have to ask. Um, the um, uh, membership in the global, pen, uh, the global polio eradication initiative, the US is a member of that. WHO plays a lead convening role. What happens there? PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, has a separate legal identity. It has only one WHO employee, which is its director general. It is overwhelmingly dependent upon US financing and, and scientific collaborations. What happens to PAHO? I, I expect it will not be treated in this particular breach that will happen. WHO has been reasonably low key in this whole period and taking a, uh, uh, not trying to escalate the tensions and trying to leave the door open. There continue to be back channel uh, quiet consultations and there continues to be hope that perhaps some of this can be worked out. The problem is figuring out what specifically has to be worked out that really matters to this administration versus is this just striking a pose for electoral prospects and, and considerations? And it really doesn't matter that much. Harold Coe, um, the former legal counsel, the State Department under President Obama at Yale Law School has, has said yes. This is in line with some of what Larry said. He said yes, this WHO, the US came into membership through an executive action approved by a bipartisan uh, congressional uh, a measure, joint resolution, perhaps Congress has the ability to insist on some role in this. We don't know. And as I said, so far we haven't seen Congress staking out any big ground on where it's going to uh, invest a lot, of, a lot in this particular prospect. There's enormous demands on Congress with very, very limited time. And of course, there's the awareness that should the president um, uh, Trump be defeated in November, then this issue reverts to restoration. So how much is going to be, and it's going to take a year to terminate the, the membership. So there's a year long grace period here while this is playing out. A couple of other uh, remarks and then I'll close. And the, we've seen signals recently that CDC is next in line potentially as a, as, as a, uh, another institution, in this case, an American institution, that can be blamed for for, uh, for some of its failings in, in, in deflecting blame on what's happened here in the United States. That bears that bears close watch. There's some um, there's the test de debacle, the differences over reopening, uh, and um, uh, Robert Redford's I mean Redfield's claims about uh, warnings about the fall when we'll have dual we'll have the flu epidemic and a set potentially a second wave. We've talked about. Um, in in Senate, in, in the Congress, we've seen some action recently. Uh, the Senator Risch has put forward a bill with two prominent um, uh, Democrats, Cardin and Murphy. That's the Global Health Security and Diplomacy Act. This is an, an interesting development. It's parallel with a very similar development inside the Trump administration, which is asking the question, what kind of new structure is needed in, by the United States to guide its engagement oversee with external partners in building capacity and response on pandemic threats. Um, what is very interesting in the Rich bill is self-consciously billed as this is not anti-WHO, this is actually a pro-WHO bill. It's calling for a coordinator for the global health security agenda to be put into the State Department modeled after the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. It's calling for a new national Global health security strategy is calling for a trust fund under WH, uh, World Bank auspices that would function in health security much like the global fund functions today. There's a similar effort, but quite different in many important respects within the White House, within the uh, Trump administration. The president's response to outbreaks, which is also calling for the creation of a coordinator within the State Department. There, there's a sense that here. 
they're planning to be diverting the funds that would be going to WHO into some other some other purpose. And there's a fear that this is also would be used to to raid accounts at USAID. Um, and then the 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 uh, ex the international uh, funding mechanism is not a trust fund in a world bank. It's seen as a sort of America first fund that would be used to counter Russia and, and Chinese influence. I just want to close by saying the Trump administration is making pretenses that it's going to do something in terms of creating a new alternative to the WHO. That idea is dead in the water. There is absolutely no support for that idea outside of the White House. Um, the U.S. Is, finds itself as it separates from WHO in an acutely isolated position in the world. Um, and I'll close there. Thank you. And over to Jana. Thank you, Steve. Um, and... Um, my first visit to the World Health Organization was in 1978. And um, and I know I've worked with Dr. Tedros. I know him well. He's a man of incredible commitment and integrity. And it's it's really distressing to um to be following Steve's and and, and Larry's comments. Um but I've been asked to talk about uh, strengthening the COVID-19 response. In the global health security agenda, and um, I want to begin by paying tribute to the to the most effective early warning system we have, and that's the courageous, astute frontline health workers. Dr. Carlos Urbani, who first uh, was sent out to Asia early in the SARS outbreak uh, for WHO, and said and sent the word back, something unusual is going on here. He ended up dying of SARS. Joanne Liu, the uh, president of MSF at the time of, of Ebola, uh, heard from her frontline workers and saw something was unusual was going on and something needed to be done. She rang the alarm, took her months, but it finally woke up to, uh, the world. And she's still with us as, as a strong voice. And um, Dr. Li Wenliang, Wen, Wen uh, the doctor who in, in Wuhan uh, also said there's something unusual going on out here and tried to ring the alarm. And these are just three of the thousands or millions of health workers around the world who are the eyes and ears and who effectively speak up, take action, and put back um, into, into the box at least 200 major outbreaks a year. So um, we have a pretty good idea what could kill millions and devastate economies worldwide. SARS, the coronaviruses, have been uh, number two on, on the global most wanted list. So that shouldn't have been a surprise. So to pick up on um, Michelle's comments, the, uh, the global health regulations, the international health regulations, it's important they had two functions. One was save lives, but the other was to uh, to to avoid unnecessary interference. Just economic disruption itself kills. We saw that after uh, the 2008 financial crash, when a quarter of a million people in Europe and North America died from cancer because of disrupted care. So the first discussion about how to make the world safer started 150 over 150 years ago. And um, it went through a series. And finally, over the last 15 years, we've had a series of efforts that have um, put into place um, an accelerator for pandemic preparedness, which is the global health security agenda. A really clear, the first time we've had a clear tool on what we should do. And, um, and then a, an accountability body. And just last fall, a, a comprehensive index. So the global health security agenda, which was catalyzed in the in the previous um, uh, U.S. administration, but really has brought together 60 plus countries, 
public and private partners realizing that it takes a whole of society response to prevent, detect, respond. And um, that, um, that alliance of 60 plus countries, public and private partners, has helped strengthen preparedness worldwide. So we now, they say that what gets measured gets done in global health. And that certainly helps to point us in the right direction. So the joint evaluation tool that was launched, the first edition in, in 2016, it really makes it explicit what's required in, in terms of, of complying with the international uh, health regulations and really making a country ready to prevent, detect, respond. That was really complemented because this was a voluntary thing. That was complemented by an effort by uh, Johns Hopkins, NTI, the Economist U U uh, Unit, to get a scorecard for each country. So we actually, and they've added not only prevent, detect, respond, but also health and norms. And so we now have a number for every country. And we, we, we can hold our, our, our leaders accountable for that. So um, how did countries uh, perform during, during uh, COVID compared to their score? Well, countries like South Korea, green over there, Thailand, Australia, Finland, they all did, did very well, moved quickly. Um, Iran really underperformed its sort of uh, middle, middle status, as, um, as did several countries. What's perplexing is, in principle, uh, UK, the US were prepared. Uh, Brazil was a bit more prepared, but they, they underperformed underperform their level of preparedness. And I think there we need to look at um, some of the dynamics of, of what has become COVID denialism in a few countries where um, it's, I mean, we remember AIDS denialism in the early 2000s when South Africa was denying AIDS, it was, it was a reality and treatable. And that cost about a half a million South African lives by the de delay. So um, just being prepared on paper doesn't mean they're gonna will perform in practice. One of the key things is this cycle of panic and complacency, where we see we see this this here this line is the committed funds. After every pandemic, and we can go back, and after every health disaster, um, we can go back to. Um, to 2000, uh, to the 9/11 uh, attack. After that, the U.S. created a a, a billion-dollar public health preventive preventive fund, which slowly trickled. Then we had uh, the bird flu went back up again, and um, then we had the financial crash. And in the following six years, after 2008, uh, we we cut the budget and lost 45,000 public health workers. So the Troubles that the U.S. have had, yes, there were a lot of things happening in, in that were particular to this point in time, but there were also dynamics that had us underfunding for decades. And so this whole cycle of panic and neglect is one of the things that undermines our preparedness. So it's we got basically of what was committed in the panic of Ebola, only half of it has been spent. So we're left nowhere near as prepared for uh, coronavirus as we as we might have been. So um, I want to leave questions. So I'm moving uh, time for questions. So I'm moving uh, forward. Uh, so what's what next for for uh, COVID-19 and uh, the. The epidemiologist that um, one of the groups that I have a lot of respect for, the Harvard and and uh, Sidrap people, Mike Osterholm and uh, Mark Lipstitch, have looked at this, and basically we're going to have it for a while. We know that could be a fall peak, and that doubling of of flu and coronavirus is a challenge. We may have uh, some peaks and valleys. But basically, if we look at how the world has actually plateaued and the decreases, we've had lots of successes of, of bringing down the pandemic. It's basically been one thing. It's been what you might call herd behavior. 
when we have enough of us active with social distancing and, and masks and, and all, um, and detecting those outbreaks which are gonna happen, testing, and then rapid response, being prepared to tighten up when, when, when necessary. One of the out, outcomes of any of these major uh, pandemics or even a, a regional epidemic as devastating as, as Ebola is it does grow the public health community and the epidemic response community. And this is just a mapping from a couple of years ago of, of the explosion of entities, two thirds of which didn't exist before Ebola or not as active. We now have uh, a large coronavirus uh, group. So making the world safer. I mean, we it, it comes down to leadership at all levels, investment, accountability, and advocacy. It's us as members of the global health community speaking in one voice that, that can push the action, hold our leaders accountable, and get the sort of dynamic it'll take to do what public health officials and scientists know would need to be done. So whenever I get asked this question, have we learned, I, I say, I don't know. But remember this moment, what happened to you, your families, your countries, and that's the energy we need to continue with if we're going to um, really make sure that the world is prepared for the, for the next one or prevents it. Thank you, and Keith, back to you. Oh, did I share my screen? Wonderful. Was I sharing nope. my screen? You did, you were perfectly fine. John, okay. all your slides came through. Fantastic, great presentation uh, to everyone. That was wonderful. So we're gonna go to some questions. I'm gonna tee up some questions right now for everybody. You'll each receive one based on what we have received. And um, we're gonna probably go to about 10 minutes over. So the first one, Michelle, uh, for you, uh, Jose said that right now there's an executive committee meeting uh, looking at potentially the insolvency of PAHO given the funding uh, situ uh, situation and you well described um, the difference between assessed contributions and voluntary funding. Do you have a sense, Michelle, about what can be done to strengthen the budget, the control of the budget that the Director General has? That's your question. Uh, the second one, uh, Larry, uh, is for you. You brought up the, another important issue about vaccine access. You said, let's prepare now for access to a COVID-19 vaccine. Can you perhaps share with the audience what it would look like in your mind to have a structure that could enable countries, particularly low-income countries, to have access to a COVID-19 vaccine when one comes around. Um, Steve, I'd like you to address the issue of uh, U.S. power, with U.S. evicting the terrain and the WHO. What are the implications for the U.S.'s ability to assert control, to, sorry, to assert power and influence with allies, given that uh, under Mr. Trump, they seem, the U.S. seems to be walking away from these multilateral uh, institutions. And John, perhaps you could uh, share with us, um, if you were the head of, uh, if you were the, the Director General of the WHO, what are the key things we need to do now to be able to strengthen the global health security agenda? What do we specifically need to do now to strengthen our ability to prevent, detect, and respond to future pandemics, which will surely come? So Michelle, over to you. Thank you. Not sure if Michelle is uh, is is on. Maybe we'll go back to Michelle and then Larry. Maybe you could um, address the question concerning the vac vaccine access, please. Sure. Um, as I said uh, during my talk, I think that the equitable uh, distribution of vaccines when we get them are among the most consequential decisions um, we can make now in the COVID pandemic, but probably in our recent history, because I've never seen um, a, a health commodity as valuable, both from a health, economic, and social point of view, than a vaccine would be. Um, as I also said that I think that um, once we know who wins the race, whether it's the Chinese, the Americans, the Europeans, or others, um, the incentive for um, equity and sharing goes down. And so now is the time to plan. So how could we do it? Um, I think we need to have a trusted 
um, influential organization that leads it could be WHO, that would be my preference. But in a JAMA article that I co-authored with a number of others, um, we, we suggested the G7 with support from the G20. Um, of course, it could be from the UN um, Security Council. But I think we need to have a trusted international actor that's leading it. I think we then have to get um, all countries to, to agree to waive, as well as uh, pharmaceutical companies, to waive um, intellectual property rights um, and to agree to a global mechanism of sharing. Currently, I had an article in Science about this. You, we have um, only one WHO or any international instrument about equitable distribution of the public goods for research, and that's the Pandemic Influence Preparedness Framework of the World Health Organization. The problem is, as the UN Secretary General's um, Ebola Commission said, is, is that number one, it's not a treaty, uh, but number two, much more importantly, that it only applies um, to um, uh, novel influen influenzas. It doesn't apply um, to coronaviruses or Ebola viruses or other kinds of diseases. And so we need to have that kind of clear, organized planning and commitment to make vaccines a global public good without price or intellectual property competition. Thank you very much, uh, Larry. Um, I don't know, Michelle, are you on at all? We'll try to get Michelle, uh, Dr. Berry back on. Uh, Steve, over to you with regard to U.S. power and the implications for the WHO. Okay, a um, couple of quick comments. Um, this decision to uh, terminate membership uh, in WHO and 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 suspend cease funding, it certainly doesn't help the U.S. standing in the world. I mean the um, uh, that combined with the fact that we have such a grave catastrophe here at home in our management of COVID-19 means that we are now the object, we're now very isolated internationally on these matters and um, we're, we're viewed with, some, with a mixture of pity, scorn, anger and contempt uh, and, uh, and sadness to see that uh, the United States position has deteriorated, uh, that its leadership ranks, its standing, its influence, its moral standing, its, its influence has declined so precipitously at this particular moment in time. And if, uh, uh, Pre if Vice President Biden is uh, elected, one of the, he's already made very clear that he understands that the pandemic and all of the attendant complexities of the response and the vaccine are going to be a top level measure uh, challenge, but also recognizes that rebuilding US standing in the world and credibility is going to be task number one. The other thing I wanna say, a couple of other things. The US-China confrontation, which has escalated and, and, and spun into a series of recriminations and, and mutual conspiracy theories uh, has paralyzed the UN Security Council. Uh, the UN Security Council has done nothing on this pandemic. And it is also true, it's and remarkable that there has been no forum, global high level forum dedicated to this pandemic. Uh, there's been financial and economic gatherings around some of the some of the instruments, and there have been blocks formed, the European bloc formed and the like, but there's a a, a, a conspicuous absence of global mobilization at a high political level for something this dangerous. And there are various reasons you can attribute to that. It's the nature of this planetary threat, but it's also a function of nationalism and this US-China uh, confrontation uh, and the like. Um, so there's a remarkable deficit in this world in terms of mobilization. On the vaccine, this is a utterly unprecedented situation. We have 7.8 billion people in the world. If we're gonna get a vaccine or more likely multiple vaccines, could be one dose, two dose, could be different populations. Um, we're talking about a, a, an enterprise of 
uh, of unthinkable proportions and complexity in terms of financing, manufacture, distribution. And today, that world, there is no coherence in the world around this. What you have is the United States, Operation Warp Speed, off on an America first uh, uh, tear, leaving the door open for collaborations. The president himself has indicated that, but taking care of his... And then we are seeing... Excuse me. And we're seeing... Um, I apologize for that. Um, so we have the United States with 14 candidates, which uh, vaccine candidates, it's picked five major corporate partners. It's going to probably draw those down to seven, making enormous financial bets on those. You have the Chinese with five, two premier ones, also putting enormous uh, financing and effort behind those. You have other European uh, options. Um, and uh, and you have some solidarity trials that are that are underway, uh, led by WHO. And you have some efforts like the ACT Accelerator to try and push a norm of equity, fairness, transparency, and the like. But I, there's, it's not at all clear how this process is going to work, and how hardline nationalist it's going to be, and who's going to be left at the back of the queue. I'm encouraged that Gavi and the Global Fund have risen up and, and moved forward. There's $563 million pledged at the Vaccine Summit for an advanced market commitment for Gavi to bring the vaccines to low-income countries that it serves. That's up only about a quarter of what it really needs for the first phase of response. So there's some really huge uncertainties hanging over all of this. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, Dr. Morrison. We'll just go to Dr. Barry, then Dr. Quick, and then we'll reverse for final comments from everybody. If you have a minute for any wrap-up comments, uh, Dr. Barry, uh, the question I had was, you brought up a, a really chilling, I think you're muted, Dr. Barry. I think you might be muted. Well, we'll go to Dr. Quick, and then we'll go back to Dr. Barry as we sort out uh, that. Um, Dr. Quick, uh, the Global Health Security Agenda, how what do we need to do to, to strengthen it? Well, and, you, you, and the question phrased, was phrased in terms of WHO, and I would say um, we, we uh, the advice to WHO is stay the course um, because it, it is, it, it, there, this is the roughest waters, but WHO has been through rough waters before. The second thing, and I want to pick up on something that's, uh, that Steve said, um, I remember being in, in a Firestone Hospital in Liberia, doing some of the work on, on the book, and talking to the medical director there, and he talked about a point, because that was one of the epicenters, where he was overwhelmed. He went to the managing director and he said, this has to be a whole company response. The Minister of Health um, in Liberia, same thing. He, then he went to President Sir Leif Johnson and said, um, we, you know, we need a whole country response. Then things started moving. And the problem here is we haven't had a, a whole of world response. So my advice and, and the, the issue is 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 embrace to, 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 um, in terms of the health security agenda, global health security and WHO's role, you know, em, embrace working with the private sector get, and with the civil society and really try to, if the sec, national, if the... Um, UN Security Council isn't doing it. Get together the business community who, who has a great interest. They're the ones who employ the, the, the millions and billions that keep the world moving and, and really get a whole of society response at the global level because that's what you need to fight a pandemic. That's what history tells us. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Quick. Uh, Dr. Barry, can you hear us and, and can you... Oh, I think you're. I think you're muted on your side. I'm so sorry. We're going to fix that up as for final comments. We're going to go in reverse, and then Jenna will will uh, call you to see if we can fix uh, the the audio with you. But we'll just go in reverse, and then Michelle will ask the question and also final comment. Um, so, John, final comment to you in terms of any wrap up advice for the audience, uh, and then we'll go to Steve, uh, Larry, and then uh, Michelle, and I'll wrap it up. John. Yeah, I mean, 
Uh, sadly, when we look at it, uh, the, 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 the public doesn't reward its leaders for prevention, but they hammer them for, uh, for failed responses. Um, I think we've got to keep ringing the bell as a community. One voice, advocacy with one voice around making the world safer. It is just unacceptable that we know what to do and how to do it. And to do to make the world safer would cost a pittance compared to, to, to the catastrophic effects. So, but it's got to come from us, the, the public health community, and, and all the different um, elements of society really holding our leaders accountable. And know your number, know where your country is on the global health security agenda. Tell the business community, talk to the Ministry of Finance, invest in making our country safer so you can have a good place to, 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 um, to come and create employment for people here and, and be a strong, healthy country. I can pay me now or pay me later. Absolutely. Strong words, Dr. Quick. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Morrison, over to you. This is just closing remarks, Keith. Yes, just a final comment if you have anything. Um, I would uh, uh, be sure to vote in November. Uh, don't forget to do that. Um, that's the single most important action that Americans can take with respect to WHO. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morrison. Uh, Professor Gostin, any final comments? I think I'm here, by the way, Keith. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. After you, we'll go to you. I'll do the question in front of you. Please. Professor Gostin. Mio, Michelle or me? Yes. Uh, Professor Gostin, please. Okay. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, you know, we, I think, you know, from the United States point of view, um, as Steve said, the election is extraordinarily important. I think we just need to be clear. I think many of us spent have spent our lives um, in global health being um, apolitical. We understand that there are people on both sides of the aisle that can actually do great things for global health, as President Bush did for PEPFAR. Um, but this is beyond the pale. It's, it's a bridge too far. We've never seen um, the world unravel. Um, the way it has and um, American uh, influence in that world. Um, but I want to have my remarks uh, go to global governance. Um, I think that there is a very clear uh, reform agenda for WHO. Um, and this is a reform that countries need to provide WHO. We need to strengthen it, not weaken it. Um, there are very, very clear um, uh, ideas that many of us have for doing that, and I hope our path will be to do that. I also hope that when we, um, one day we'll be beyond COVID, um, won't be for a long time, but we will be. And then we have to build up our global institutions. We have to build up the rule of law. We have to build up globalism and human rights. We've seen all of these things being torn asunder um, uh, during this uh, pandemic, um, and even before with, with the rise of populism. I think if COVID has taught us anything, is, is that you know, if, we, if we really commit um, to a, a world that, that, that relies on strong public health capacities, um, scientific um, integrity, and, um, and, and, and um, legitimacy, um, as well as human rights and the rule of law, we'll all be in this together in a much stronger place. Thank you very much, Professor Gostin. Dr. Barry, so the question that we had, and then for final comments from you, you brought up a really jarring uh, slide that showed that as the Director General, the assessed contributions, the, essentially the budget of the WHO, is only 17% of the monies that's there. And yet 83% uh, is is really earmarked funds. So can you suggest ways in which we can strengthen that budget for the Director General of the WHO, uh, maybe uh, taking a percentage of the earmarked funds to go to uh, the assessed contributions? How can we strengthen the core budgetary function of the WHO? Well, I, I think this pandemic is a clarion call um, to how we need to restructure um, the WHO financing. 
Um, and unfortunately, I don't think U.S. will be the savior right now. And I can't say enough about um, Steve's remark about voting in November. Um, I have the honor of being on Biden's health policy team, and I can tell you that they're very aware um, of the importance of um, WHO and financing WHO. But I, 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 it, it's broken. We need to fix it. It's the call right now. Um, but I'd like to end on something we haven't touched upon, and that's the fact that um, we are all living on one planet. Um, and until we get that concept, um, and I'd like to think about this as human and planetary health, that there are, and I ended my slide with these existential threats that are not within borders, whether it be um, pollution or climate change um, or these kind of emerging diseases. Um, I think we need to believe in science, which we've stopped believing in. Um, and I think we need to believe in uh, the concept of global public goods and global shared governance. So I'd like to end with that um, and end with this concept of um, human and planetary health. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Berry. And I'd like to thank all of you, all of our presenters today for being on this wonderful webinar. Um, but as Dr. Berry said, the health of our health and the health of our planet are inseparable. We've heard from Dr. Gostin a coup de coeur, a cry of the heart, that we need to work together to be able to deal with the threats that we see today, because the threats that we face know no boundaries, know no borders, and they affect all of us. So we're all in this together. And really our option, our only legitimate option is to strengthen the WHO, not walk away from it. And we heard from Dr. Morrison, one yes, little quick comment, because I got muted for a little while. If anybody wants to read a fabulous article, Ezekiel Emanuel wrote a great article about how resources should be um, particularly um, dealt to countries that have low access. And it's, a, it's in the New England Journal. It's a fantastic, I think we're gonna be dealing with this with vaccine, with high dose drugs like remdesivir, high expensive drugs like remdesivir. Um, I think we need as a world to globally sit back. And this is where WHO um, can really play a role with ethical committees set up. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just had to get that in. It's a great article. Thank you, Dr. Barry. You are the chair of CUGH, so I'm not going to cut you off. I can't. Because <laughs> really. I'm your boss. Dr. <laughs> and Dr. Morrison, uh, thank you for that pithy and powerful comment. Voting is your power. Vote. And Dr. Quick, I would encourage everybody to read your book on preventing uh, epidemics. Uh, thank you for, for laying out what we need to do to strengthen the WHO's ability to prevent, detect, and respond to pandemics. And for all of you who are joining us today, uh, you'll be able to see this webinar on CUGH's website, cugh.org, where you'll be able to see future webinars we have. And I'd like to thank Jenna Smith here on our team who produces these webinars and does a fantastic job. So to all of you, thank you for joining us today at CUGH's webinar series, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.